Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the moderators uh, for allowing us the opportunity to present our work, uh, one stage minimally invasive Ivor Lewis esophagectomy without patient repositioning. We have no disclosures. Um, my goals today, uh, I'd like to briefly describe the history of minimally invasive esophagectomy as it pertains to the development of our operative technique. Uh, I'd like to discuss in detail our approach to the uh, one-stage minimally invasive Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, uh, and then to discuss the outcomes uh, that we've seen in our institution. So esophagectomy is a complex surgical procedure. Uh, it's associated with substantial uh, post-operative morbidity and mortality. And as such, surgeons have adopted a number of minimally invasive techniques in order to minimize post-operative complications. Uh, the first of these approaches uh, was described in 1992, uh, and um, this described a thoracoscopic approach performed in five patients. Um, subsequently, several other approaches have been developed. Uh, Dr. Lukatich's group at uh, the University of Pittsburgh has been uh, particularly prolific in this area, uh, publishing a study in 2003 um, looking at a three-hole approach, and then later in 2010, uh, a two-stage Ivor Lewis approach. Uh, both of these approaches require repositioning of the patient uh, between the laparoscopic and the thoracoscopic phases. And this two-stage approach is primarily the method that we used in our facility until around 2012. Um, so what changed? Well, um, there was a paper published in 2010 out of Oshner looking at extracorporeal versus intracorporeal gastric conduit construction. And what they found was that the anastomotic leak rates as well as the rates of distal positive margins were significantly lower in the patients uh, that had extracorporeal construction of the conduit. Uh, and so in order to adapt this method to minimally invasive techniques, uh, we had to figure out a way in order to perform a high esophageal transection without uh, repositioning the patient multiple times. Um, incidentally, uh, such a method had been described back in 1975 for open esophagectomy uh, with two teams working simultaneously in the chest and the abdomen. Um, we felt that we could adapt this uh, to a minimally invasive approach, uh, which would allow for extracorporeal conduit construction and would eliminate the need to reposition, reprep, redrape the patient, and improve our operative efficiency. Uh, so a large part of our operative technique hinges on patient positioning. Uh, the patient is positioned supine, and the upper torso is rotated towards the patient's left. The right arm is brought across the chest, and we use a padded arm support to support that right arm. Uh, we use several uh, lateral body supports at the bilateral hips, the left chest, as well as the right scapula. Uh, and this allows uh, total access to the right chest in the event that we need to convert to a posterior lateral uh, thoracotomy. Um, uh, using this positioning, uh, we are able to prep both the chest and the abdomen into the same surgical field. Um, the operation is started uh, by making a, a small epigastric hand port incision through which we extract the specimen and um, uh, assist in retraction during dissection of the, uh, the stomach. Um, we then make three five millimeter incisions along the left uh, subcostal margin and um, proceed with uh, laparoscopic mobilization of the stomach. Uh, we identify the left gastric artery, skeletonize it, and uh, divide it using an endoscopic vascular stapler. We then mobilize the distal esophagus up into the mediastinum and intentionally open the right pleura uh, before uh, proceeding to the thoracoscopic portion of the procedure. Um, at this point, we rotate the patient towards the right, um, putting, the ch putting the chest up uh, into a semi-left lateral decubitus position. Um, two five millimeter ports are placed, one at the inferior angle of the scapula and one um, inferiorly at the posterior axillary line. Two 12 millimeter ports are placed at the anterior axillary line and we make a three centimeter incision uh, which will uh, be used to accommodate the post of a endoscopic um, circular stapler. Um, from this point, uh, we mobilize the esophagus further up into the mediastinum, uh, making sure that we obtain adequate margins. And once we are sure that the margins are adequate, um, we use a combination of EGD um, and um, 
uh, assessing the preoperative imaging in order to determine this, we um, then uh, divide the esophagus with a linear stapler. We then move back to the stomach, uh, which we uh, then deliver the stomach and the distal esophagus through the hand port um, and proceed with extracorporeal construction of the conduit. Uh, we use the greater curve and we uh, place retraction at the fundus of the stomach in order to uh, elongate the, the stomach and get a, um, a uniform diameter uh, of our entire conduit. Uh, it also helps minimize bunching at the staple line. Um, we then use uh, either Doppler or endocyanine green fluorescence angiography in order to assess the perfusion of the conduit. Uh, we've previously published that uh, the endocyanine green angiography uh, significantly decreases uh, rates of anastomotic leak in our institution. We then perform a gastric drainage procedure, uh, either pyloromyotomy or, or uh, pyloroplasty, and then place the conduit up through the hiatus into the chest. A uh, jejunostomy tube is placed if it was not present preoperatively, and we uh, then close the abdomen. At this point, we uh, move back to the chest to complete the procedure. Uh, we position the conduit in the posterior mediastinum. Um, we place a uh, circular anvil in the proximal esophagus using a transoral device, and uh, then insert the circular stapler through the three centimeter incision um, and position it in, uh, through the open end of the gastric conduit. Um, once we make sure that we've uh, eliminated the redundancy of the conduit, uh, we dock the stapler and create the anastomosis. Um, at this point, we uh, remove the excess shepherd's crook of the conduit uh, using a linear stapler. Uh, we place the chest tube and then close the chest. So between September 2007 and November 2016, uh, 200 patients underwent minimally invasive esophagectomy in our institution. Uh, 82 of these patients were done via the two-stage approach uh, as described by the Pittsburgh group, and 118 were described uh, or were performed via the one-stage approach, which I've just described. Uh, the median age in these patients was 64. Uh, the one-stage group was slightly older, um, probably not clinically significant and 80% um, were male, 90% were Caucasian, and there were no differences between the groups in, uh, in regards to demographics. Uh, there was uh, no difference in tumor histology, clinical or pathologic TNM staging between the two groups, um, and the one-stage group uh, underwent more neoadjuvant therapy and, and less adjuvant therapy uh, than the two-stage group. Importantly, uh, when we looked at median operative time, the one-stage approach is associated with significantly uh, shorter operative times. And uh, you can see from the graph that over the entire course of the series, our operative times uh, decreased. However, there was a significant uh, drop-off between uh, uh, the, in the interval between our, uh, the switch from the two-stage to the one-stage approach, uh, which we felt uh, was likely um, independent of operative experience. And indeed, on multi multivariable analysis, uh, the one-stage approach is predictive of shorter operative time, while operative experience um, is, uh, was not significant, uh, nor were any other uh, demographic or uh, tumor-related factors. Uh, additionally, we looked at lymph node harvest. Uh, there, lymph node harvest for the one-stage approach was significantly better than for the two-stage approach, although this uh, did not hold up on multivariable analysis and uh, the rates of positive margins were uh, fairly similar between the two groups. Um, we also looked at our post-operative complication rates. Uh, our, for the one-stage approach, the rates of anastomotic leak, pneumonia, and ARDS were significantly lower than the two-stage group uh, on univariate analysis. However, again, this did not hold up on multivariable analysis. Uh, mortality uh, was low overall, um, and there were no intraoperative mortalities. Uh, they um, were similar between the two groups. Hospital length of stay was also shorter in the one-stage group on univariate analysis, um, but the uh, two-stage group, um, or, but uh, this was not true on multivariable analysis. So in summary, uh, I have described uh, our approach to one stage minimally invasive Ivor Lewis esophagectomy without patient repositioning, which provides facile access to both the chest and the abdomen and allows for extracorporeal construction of the gastric conduit. 
Uh, I've also shown how this decreases our operative time uh, with no decrement in lymph node harvest or zero resection rate or complications. So while we recognize that our study does have um, several limitations, uh, we find that it is both ergonomic and efficient, and we hope that those of you performing minimally invasive esophagectomy uh, will find this technique helpful. Thank you. This paper is open for discussion. Ralph A. Seattle, very nice uh, technique, really intriguing. Uh, I'm curious about the differences in the anastomotic leak rates. I think you, uh, we're probably assuming that's because you think the conduit recreation is more um, accurate with the extracorporeal approach, um, but could you comment on that? So the, the paper that I cited, um, they felt that the uh, extracorporeal approach gave the surgeon a better ability to assess for ischemia of the gastric conduit um, up there at the tip near the fundus. Uh, and also to assess for any residual tumor. Um, and so basically they felt that uh, the surgeon would better be able to assess very well vascularized anastomosis with healthy tissues there. But again, we didn't find that there was a difference in our two groups. So I have a question, I guess, and a comment. It seems to me that you've, you've made this revision simply so that you can have an access incision in the belly to make your uh, conduit, is that correct? That was the initial thought, and then um, it, we kind of have the unintended benefit of shortening our operative times. And because it seems like a lot of back and forth. You're in the belly, then you're in the chest, then you're back to the belly, then you're back to the chest. And um, the uh, Ottawa Thoracic Group published, you know, if you just did the belly and the chest, you could simply make a, a, a longer low down thoracotomy in the chest to make your conduit through the Th thoracic axis, then you wouldn't have to be back in the belly because the benefit of having your belly axis would be to go back after you've done the chest anastomosis, go back to the belly and then potentially anchor the the left gas, the, the greater curve of the pull up to the left cruise so that you avoid the, the main complication of ivory loose esophagectomy, which is parasophageal hernia creation because nobody anchors the, uh, the conduit to the uh, left cruise. Yes. Um, it, there is a lot of back and forth uh, it, with the way that I've described this. Um, the ports and everything remain in place. The patient's in the same positions. So we just kind of have to rotate the table. The surgeon doesn't have to switch sides. It's as easy as switching the camera from one port to the next. Um, so that's uh, not that cumbersome um, in our experience. Uh, and also, as we've gotten better at this technique and done it more often over time, we've started to transition to doing basically two phases where we do all of the mobilization through the stomach and then um, uh, basically create the conduit and then close the abdomen and then transition to the chest. Um, but we just haven't done that as much. So, so just one quick question. You didn't show any video, but and I, we, you did show how you rotate the patient's thorax up maybe to 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, is there any distortion at the hiatus when you go to the abdominal part by putting them in that position? And it would seem it would promote the liver from falling across the hiatus if you're in that position. Slightly. Um, so <laughs> we actually use a level uh, in order to rotate the patient. Um, we've kind of figured out 16 degrees um, to the to the right uh, for the abdominal portions and 20 degrees to the left for the thora the thoracic portions. Um, it actually does not cause that much distortion um, from the abdominal standpoint. Part of that may be due to the fact that we have a hand in there uh, to really retract the stomach up and, and retract the liver up. Um, but we just haven't seen a lot of It seems like you should include your setup time to position the patient as part of your operative time because it sounds like it's complicated to, to you know, measure the, the degree of angle and whatnot. I'm like, that, that, that's probably in as much time as it takes uh, us to sort of put a double lumen in and turn the patient you know, as a thoracic group, that, that's pretty quick for us. That's not like a, it's yeah. not like an hour of turnover time to change from the chest to the belly. So it seems like you need to you count that preoperative setup time because you've excluded that and, and that may be your, that we've may be your difference. We've actually looked at that uh, and there's not a difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions from the, uh, the audience? All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.